Okay? Now we go into scene four, or act four, excuse me. <coughs> act three is ended, act four begins. It begins with the last verse of chapter 11, which is the opening vision. Each act has an opening vision of some heavenly thing that is seen. Um, in act two, he was caught into the throne room and he saw the throne and the beings up there glorifying God in the book. In Act 3, he saw angels putting uh, incense, burning incense before God in heaven, followed by the casting down of coals of judgment upon the earth. Here we see the opening vision is just one verse long, but again it's the heavenly vision of what's going on in heaven. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake. Now, why? what does this vision have to do? with what is about to follow. Mainly, it is a view of the Ark of the Covenant. In the other opening visions, there has largely been action. At least in, in Acts 2 and Acts 3, we've seen action. In Act 1, the opening vision was simply a vision of Christ himself. And here, it is simply a vision of the Ark of the Covenant. Why? To remind us of the covenant. Jesus, when he sat with his disciples just before his death, said, this blood is the new covenant. This, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And he has entered into covenant with us. And that is very important in light of the next act. Because he's going to describe intensive persecution from the beast. And he's going to, and from the dragon. And he wants to call to our minds that this is all part in, and in keeping and consistent with the covenant that he has made with us. He deals with us separately than he deals with others. He preserves us because of his covenant. And before he gets into the terrors, of the scene before us, or the act before us, he wants us to re be reminded of the covenant in heaven that we have. So that regardless of what we see happening on earth here, we see that God is in covenant with us, and we are his people uh, after all. Okay, chapter 12 then. Now this act, or this, yeah, act 4, I have called the seven wondrous visions. This is the first time we come to an act where John does not number the sequences for us. He doesn't say, here's the first one, here's the second one, the third, fourth, and fifth, and sixth, and so forth. He doesn't do that, but we still find, I believe, seven wondrous visions, and as usual, uh, an interlude between the sixth and the seventh. But as the opening vision of this one is very short, only one verse, so the interlude is only one verse also, and we'll see that. Anyway, the first uh, vision... The first wondrous vision is that of a woman and a dragon. And, and uh, it's the entirety of chapter 12 is the, is the first wondrous vision he sees. <coughs> and so we'll read this chapter and we'll make relevant comments. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. This identifies her with Israel because in Genesis 37, verses 9 and 10, Genesis 37, 9 and 10, Joseph, one of the twelve sons of Jacob, had a dream in which the sun and the moon and the eleven stars bowed down to him. And his father Jacob said, Shall your mother and I and your eleven brothers bow down to you? In other words, he understood that the sun and the moon and the eleven stars represented Jacob's family, or Joseph's family. Uh, there would be 12 stars altogether, including Joseph, who had the dream, to whom the others were bowing down. So the 12 stars represent, uh, the sun, moon, 12 stars represent the family of Israel. Now, in particular, it seems very clear that this woman represents not just the whole of ethnic Israel, but rather the spiritual Israel of the Old Testament, the remnant, uh, the, what we would rightly call the church of the Old Testament the believing remnant that always existed. God has always had a believing remnant from the time of Abel until the present and will until the coming of Christ. There have always been those who were believers and by faith have been received a good report and have been his people. In the nation Israel, there was, of course, that believing remnant. They are the ones that are here credited with bringing forth the Messiah. It was obviously representatives of that remnant, Joseph and Mary, Simeon and Anna, uh, Zecharias and Elizabeth, these, these were all part of the believing remnant of Israel at, at the day when Jesus came, and it was through their involvement that we see the coming of the Messiah. Okay? And she, being with child, cried, prevailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. 
you will find in Isaiah chapter 26, verses 17 and 18, uh, the prophet bemoans the fact that his nation, Israel, has been in travail but have produced no child. They have been in travail because they've suffered at the hands of other nations, but they've not produced the righteousness and justice in the earth that has been desired. That is in Isaiah 26, verses 17 and 18. But also in Isaiah chapter 66, verses 7 through 9, he predicts a time when Zion will travail and bring forth her fruit. And it is a prediction of the church coming and the messianic age. And so the image of Israel travailing like a woman is a picture of the sufferings Israel went through in the Old Testament days, seeking to remain the people of God, especially the remnant, seeking to remain true to God in the face of great persecutions over the centuries. Travailing because of one thing. They were going to bring forth a child. And this we see happens right here. Chapter 12 of Revelation takes us back to the beginning, to the birth of Jesus. Uh, we start all over the whole picture of the church age here. She's with child. She's travailing birth, pain to be delivered. There appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to d devour her child as soon as it was born. <coughs> and she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up into God and unto his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Now, here's what he sees at this point. The woman is ready to bear. Then he sees a dragon. The description of the dragon is interesting. It's red, has seven heads and ten horns with crowns upon those horns. Um, I will have more to say about the seven heads and the ten horns when we get to the description of the beast in chapter 13. You'll find that the beast is also red, has seven heads and ten horns, and is only a thinly disguised devil. The dragon has the same characteristics as the beast, essentially. There is a reference to the heads of Leviathan in, in Psalm 74, 14, where Leviathan represents Egypt, the persecutor of the Jews before the Exodus. Uh, I, uh, Psalm 74 is talking about the Exodus, and in verse 14 he talks about how God broke the heads of Leviathan, the dragon. Uh, so it speaks of a multi-headed dragon, representing Egypt in the Psalms, but here representing the devil, just because what Egypt was to the Jews, the devil is to us. The blood of the Passover lamb delivered the Jews from Egypt. The blood of Christ, our Passover, delivers us from the devil. So the, the Egypt is like a type of the devil. Pharaoh is like a type of the devil, and it's compared to a dragon with heads that God wounded at the Exodus in Psalm 74, 14. And here we have the devil described as a dragon that has heads, then his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. Many have understood this to mean that a third of the angels fell with the devil. However, this is the only place that could be so construed. There's no other place in the Bible that suggests such a thing. And this does not appear to be a reference to this fall of angels. Certainly, this is too late in history for that. This is talking about the time when the Jews were about ready to bring forth Messiah, just immediately before Christ's birth. And yet the dragon is seen drawing a third of the stars and, and, dragon, and throwing them down to the earth. This goes back to Daniel chapter 7. <coughs> and um, of course Daniel chapter 7 also has a lot of parallels with what we're about to read. Especially in chapter 13. But Daniel chapter 7 um, and verse 7, describing the fourth beast which is Rome, said, After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth, it devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the others, it had ten horns. Um, let's see, where does it go on? It talks about, I hope I'm not mistaken here, let me see. Okay, I'm in the wrong passage. Chapter 8 and verse 10. Sorry, of Daniel. Uh, this is talking... I'm sorry, I, I misdirected you. I thought it was said of, uh, the, of Rome 
it doesn't matter for our interpretation of Revelation, but I wanted to talk about what it means to cast the stars to the ground. Uh, there's a little horn in uh, Daniel 8, verse 9, which represents Antiochus Epiphanes, the persecutor of the Jews shortly before Jesus came. And it says of him in verse 10, Daniel 8:10, he waxed great even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. That's why I thought Rome was talked about the same way, because it talks about the beast stamping the residue with, with his feet. Here, Antiochus Epiphanes, who reigned about 168 years before Christ came, relatively shortly before the coming of Christ, is said to have cast stars to the ground. Now, certainly Antiochus Epiphanes didn't cause any angels to fall. It's talking about how he overthrew godly men. And in Daniel, stars represent godly men. Because it says in Daniel chapter 12, those who turn many to righteousness shall shine as the stars forever. And <clears throat> the same may be true in some cases in Revelation. Because if the seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches, and if the seven angels of the seven churches are the seven uh, pastors of the churches, as some people believe, then they would be men also. The stars would represent men then too. This dragon, shortly before the birth of Christ, cast many stars a third, which is a significant minority, to the ground. He does what Antiochus does. In fact, it may be a reference to Antiochus shortly before the birth of Jesus, uh, bringing great trouble to the Jews and casting down many of their most prominent leaders uh, before Jesus was born. At any rate, he now stands poised, ready to devour the child as soon as it's born. That's the main reason he's in this vision. He's an enemy of the woman and her child. He's mostly after the child. He persecutes the woman, too, but the child is what he's really after. And the child is a man-child, and described in verse 5 as one who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Now, that is a reference to Jesus Christ. In Psalm chapter 2 and verse 9, it is said of Jesus that he will rule the nations with a rod of iron. Now, I know that he also made that promise to one of the churches, to the overcomers, that they would rule with him with a rod of iron. But, and so some people have identified the man-child as overcomers in the last days, and they speak of a man-child company and so forth uh, that will rise up in the last days, but I hardly see that as fitting the picture here. This is a reference to Jesus, who is, throughout the scripture, the one who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron. He's caught up to God in his throne. In other words, the whole lifetime of Jesus is passed over in one verse. He's born, he's destined for the throne, and he's caught up to the throne, which he was at the end of his life. Now, why does it pass over such significant things as the ministry of Jesus and his death and resurrection and just skip to his ascension? Obviously, because John knows that those other points are talked about elsewhere and well established. That's not what he wants to focus on now. What he wants to focus on is what happened to the woman after her child was caught up. So he passes very quickly over the whole career of Jesus in one verse so that he can get to... He passes over much well-known material in order to get to something that he wants to focus upon, namely the fate of the church after Jesus left. And the woman, who was, of course, the remnant, the believing remnant of Israel who had brought forth the man-child, she flees into the wilderness where she has a place prepared of God and they should feed her for three and a half years. Now, the woman fleeing to the wilderness has many things that it, it refers, or, or I mean, many things that are brought, drawn together. For one thing, we know that the remnant... <coughs> of the Jews, the, the Christians in Jerusalem fled to the wilderness and escaped the fall of Jerusalem when Satan brought the armies of Rome. Also, God brought them. Satan and God each had a role in it. But the, in a sense, Tacitus says that Titus wanted to destroy Christianity with the destruction of Rome too. And yet they escaped. And they fled to the wilderness. Now, in a greater sense, this is not a picture even just of that, but of the Exodus again. Because the Jews, when they fled from the dragon Egypt in the days of Moses, they fled into the wilderness, and there they were nourished for 40 years. But as I pointed out, the book of Numbers lists 42 encampments they had. The 1260 days listed here is identical to the 42 months of chapter 11 and verse 2. And therefore, it is a picture, I believe, of the wilderness wanderings. As the Jews fled from Egypt and ended up for 40 years in the wilderness, so the church escapes destruction because God nourishes and preserves it for a period that is, that is analogous to the Jews wandering in the wilderness. Our present church age, this three and a half year period that is the symbol of the whole church age, 
is analogous to the wandering of the Jews in the wilderness. Now, I'd like to point that out just by uh, one important passage in 1 Corinthians 10 that I alluded to earlier, but I'll take the time to note uh, more specifically now. 1 Corinthians 10, Paul talks about the Jews who came out of Egypt into the wilderness. And he says in verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I would that you would not be ignorant how that all of our fathers were under the clouds, all passed through the sea, that is the Red Sea in the Exodus, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They did all eat the same spiritual meat, that's manna, which they ate in the wilderness. They drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from that rock, spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for he overthrew many in the wilderness. He gives some examples of how they were overthrown and bitten by snakes and so forth. And then he says in verse 11, Now all these things happened unto them for examples. The word examples in the Greek is types. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. These things that happened to the Jews in the wilderness were types of our experience. He says that also in verse 6. 1 Corinthians 10, 6, he says, Now all these things were our examples. Again, the word is types. To the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they did. In other words, what happened to them in the wilderness was a type of what we're going through. Temptation, the possibility of defection, we, have, we drink of the spiritual drink. We eat of the heavenly bread. We have been baptized in the, in the water and in the spirit. Uh, the, the experiences they had were a type of our experience. And the wandering of the Jews in the wilderness for that 40 years is a type of the present church age. Now, there's another sense in which the entering into the promised land is a type of the church age. But there's, that changes the image and has different things involved. But there is definitely a place where the Jews wandering in the wilderness for 40 years was a type of the church age. And so, John uses that type and pictures the church being nurtured for the whole church age, kept alive by God despite persecution from Satan. Just like the Jews in the wilderness were nurtured after they escaped the dragon, Egypt. So you see the connection, I hope, between what John is saying about ex the exodus and the church, because again, we have experienced a spiritual exodus. Then he sees the heavenly scene in verses 7 through 10, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought with his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, the old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. Okay? Now, this war in heaven, you've heard me say this before, I believe it corresponds to what was going on on earth during the life of, uh, of Jesus. When Jesus was casting out demons, exposing the enemy, healing the sick, bringing in the kingdom of God, there was a corresponding spiritual reality that no one saw. But John is now given a vision of that. He sees the victory of Christ at the cross as though a great war between the angels and the demons has been won. Michael representing the leader of the, demonic, of the angelic powers, the dragon Satan being the representative, the leader of the demonic powers. And it's as though he sees the corresponding thing. It's, we could say that Michael could be compared to the staff officer who was able to move Satan's flag in heaven because Jesus on the field of battle has won the victory. So we see something in heaven that uh, symbolizes what has happened on earth, uh, the victory of Christ. And the reason I say so is because in verse 10, after the, the dragon is cast out at the end of the spiritual battle, the voice in heaven says, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. Certainly this must refer to what happened at the cross. The kingdom of God and the power of his Christ. Do you remember how Jesus said in Mark 9, 1, I think it is, some of you standing here shall not taste of death before you see the, the kingdom come with power. And so this is what John's referring to here. The kingdom came with power at the cross and, uh, and maybe even at Pentecost. But see, what I, what I see here is the victory of Christ is treated as one event. You know, we see it as spread out over a period of three and a half years, which would include his teaching, his temptation, his, uh, you know, his uh, arrest, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, the day of Pentecost, and all these things. Those are kind of compressed into one event. God was doing a thing with all of that. And what he did was the bringing in of the kingdom of God in power 
and the out, throwing out of the accuser of the brethren. Now, the accuser of the brethren is an interesting uh, reference to Satan here because in the Old Testament, Satan is very seldom seen, but when he is seen, he's accusing. He accuses Job in Job chapters 1 and 2. He accuses the high priest Zechariah, uh, or high priest uh, Joshua in Zechariah chapter 3. Uh, and very seldom else do we see him in the Old Testament. But he's accusing. He's the one who always is, is pointing out the faults and trying to gain mastery over people. In Jude verse 9, it says that Satan debated with Michael at one time over the body of Moses, apparently accusing Moses and trying to obtain his rights over him um, in Jude verse 9. So Satan was the accuser in the Old Testament times, and he apparently had grounds to accuse us. And he did. Those grounds were the law. God gave the law, and that gave Satan grounds to accuse. Because we haven't kept the law. That's what Paul points out very frequently. The law condemns us. And therefore, as long as we're under the law, as long as the legal system is in, Satan has plenty of grounds to, con to condemn us, to, to accuse us before God and point out how much we've broken the law. But what happened at the cross was the law as a means of justification, or even as an imagined means of justification, is done away, and justification is by faith and grace through the blood of Jesus Christ. There is no longer any grounds for accusation, and, and Romans 8 says, whom God has justified, who can bring any charge against him? Uh, who can bring anything to the charge against God's elect? Paul says. It is God that justifies. There is no more any grounds for accusation against us in heaven because of the, the blood of Christ. And that's what it means when it says in verse 11, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony and they loved not their lives unto the death. We are seeing here a warfare. Satan is cast down to the earth, symbolic of the fact that God won't listen to his accusations in heaven anymore. So what does he do? He's an accuser still. He accuses us to ourselves. He tries to make us feel condemned. But we overcome this accusing activity by the blood of the Lamb. That is, by declaration of the fact that we trust in the merits of the blood of Jesus to cover all those things for which we're being accused. There is no grounds for us to be accused as a result of the blood of Jesus. He nailed to the cross with him the handwriting and ordinances that were against us, according to Colossians chapter 2. And therefore, when Satan comes and accuses us and seeks to make us feel condemned, we are, John is telling us here, God won't listen to it anymore. He threw the dude out of heaven. He won't even listen anymore to those accusations. But now he's on earth accusing you to your own self and trying to make you feel condemned all the time. But we overcome that by appeal to the blood of the Lamb. We plead the blood. That is our plea for our righteousness. And so they overcame Satan in more than one way here. By the blood of the Lamb, this speaks of overcoming his accusing activity. By the word of their testimony, speaks of their preaching the gospel to the world and therefore taking territory from the, the dragon and bringing the message of forgiveness and of the blood of the Lamb to all nations, actually taking territory from the enemy and love not their lives unto the death shows that overcoming Satan does not mean survival necessarily. Uh, dying is in itself an act of, a valiant act of war against the enemy. To, let, to lay down your life for the kingdom of God, brings great gains to the kingdom of God and therefore is, is an act of overcoming the power of darkness. I mean, Jesus is the prime example. He laid down his life deliberately and in so doing, he brought about the greatest victory uh, against the kingdom of darkness ever experienced. And the martyrs who lay down their lives in taking the gospel to every nation are overcoming the enemy in further ways. We know very well that the blood of martyrs is seed and that every time martyrs died in the arenas, people in the stands were converted as a result of that testimony. Even in our modern times, when those five martyrs in Ecuador, Jim Elliott and, and uh, Nate Saint and, and the others, when those five men were martyred, uh, I read that after their martyrdom became public news, which was very rapidly, there were immediately over a thousand college students who enrolled in mission boards to go on the mission field who were inspired by the, by the five missionaries who died. No one would ever have heard of Jim Elliott if he had not died a martyr. He would be some obscure missionary like thousands of others in Ecuador right now, working out, probably the whole tribe wouldn't have been saved and everything, but we would have never heard of Jim Elliott. But because he loved not his life unto the death, Satan lost a lot of ground 
Because the whole, essentially, not all, but, but the majority of the tribes that he went to reach responded to the gospel, largely through the testimony of his martyrdom, plus thousands of missionaries went on the field, and even to this day, still there are people going to mission field after reading about Jim Elliot and the others who died. The blood of martyrs is a powerful weapon against the kingdom of darkness. And really the warfare that's seen here is twofold. Defensive against the accusations of Satan for which we bring the blood of Jesus to our defense. And offensive where we go out with the word of our testimony and lay down our lives if necessary in order to take territory from the enemy. Uh, this is the warfare as it's described in verse 11. Then it says, Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and to the sea for the devil has come down to you having great wrath and because he knoweth he hath but a short time. Now, Satan knows his time is limited now. Before Jesus came, there were thousands of years, about 4,000 or more, very possibly up to 10,000 or more, that Satan held sway over the human race. And there was really nothing that made it look like things were going to change. Then at the cross, Satan realized he got stung. I mean, he got, he got burned bad. And he knows that he's lost now. And he knows that whether the church age is a thousand or two thousand years, it's still a short time compared to what he used to have. He had thousands of years before, but now he's got a limited time. His days are numbered. He has, a, he has an allotted time in which to do his damage because the day is coming and it won't be probably a whole lot longer from now uh, when he's not going to be able to do any more. So he's doing it with a, with a, a vengeance. Now, what is he doing, however? The woe is pronounced upon those who inhabit the earth. I want to just challenge you. I don't have the time to do it with you right now. I would like to challenge you to do a word study from Revelation with a concordance on the inhabitants of the earth, or those who inhabit the earth. Compare those. There's even one place in chapter 13, I think it is, or, or somewhere like that, that contrasts them with those who inhabit heaven. And it would seem that the inhabitants of the earth represent those who are unsaved. The inhabitants of heaven represent those who are saved. Now, that doesn't mean that the saved are now gone to heaven in the rapture. What it means is that our citizenship is in heaven and our habitation is in heaven. But the rest of the world, those who are unsaved, this is their home. They are the inhabitants of the earth. Their citizenship is here. And it's almost as though you get the impression, if you study it out with the concordance, that John uses this term, the inhabitants of the earth, as a technical term for unsaved people. They belong to this world. This is their home. And, and it's used in contrast with saved people. Now, if that is true, and I'll let you decide from your own research whether that's true or not, then when it says, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, it's mainly a woe upon the unsaved during this period of time. Why? Because the enemy is wrathful and he's going to do all he can. But what is he going to do? He certainly doesn't necessarily concentrate his physical violence on the unsaved, although there's a lot of it that does go on in wars and things like that, which no doubt the devil uh, makes use of. But I believe we see something else as his strategy here. And we have to read the rest of the verses to see what it is. But this is why the inhabitants of the world have so much to fear. Verse 13 says, And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And as we were already told, she fled to the, uh, the, the woman... <clears throat> to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into a place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. That's obviously a repetition of what we read in verse 6. Except there is mentioned here the wings of a great eagle. I'd point out that in Exodus 19 and at verse 4 where God is reminding the Jews of the recent exodus out of Egypt. He says, I bore you on eagles' wings. Speaking of his delivering them out of Egypt in the Exodus, he says that he bore them on eagles' wings, which is, and also in Deuteronomy chapter 32, Moses again is talking to the Jews about the Exodus and, and God preserving them. Deuteronomy 32, uh, verses 10 and 11 talks about how God was like a mother eagle who bore them on, her, on his wings, talking about, again, the Exodus and his saving them. So, Throughout this chapter, we have many echoes of the Exodus. The dragon is an echo of Egypt. The wilderness is an echo of uh, the Jews' wilderness wanderings. Uh, the eagle's wings here, they're carried on eagle's wings, just like God said he carried them out of Egypt on eagle's wings. Um, and here, the time, times, and half a time is equated with the 1260 
days, otherwise known as the church age. And it says, here's, here's the attack that came. Verse 15. The serpent cast out of his mouth waters as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, notice the water came out of his mouth. What comes out of a person's mouth? Their words. The sword that proceeds out of Jesus' mouth represents his word. The water in this case, out of the dragon's mouth, is most likely to be seen as his words. And it is a flood of deception that he sends. And the woman is not taken away in it, notice. He wants to sweep away the church with deceptive heresies, which he sent many of them in the early days of the church and still does to this day. It's still a major strategy of the devil is to deceive. And this flood that comes out of his mouth is like a flood of error, a flood of lies, of heresy, of apostasy that he wants to bring. But the true woman is delivered from it. But who swallows it? The earth. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Because this is a time where they will, of course, because they reject Christ, have no discernment about truth and error, and they will be led into deep deception by the enemy during this time. You see, the whole three and a half year period is a time when the two witnesses are testifying. Some people are accepting their testimony. Others are rejecting it. Those who reject it are buying for themselves strong delusion, which God will allow them to have come upon them because they did not receive the love of the truth. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 tells us. And <clears throat> what we see here is the devil seeks to destroy the church by sending all this error, this flood of deception into the world. But the true church won't be deceived. The elect will not be deceived. But the world buys it. The world swallows it. Now it says the earth helped the woman by swallowing it, but that's not necessarily to mean that the earth, by, by becoming deceived, is intending to help the church. Rather, it's as he sees the picture happening, he sees this flood coming to the woman, and the earth opens up, he can see the woman is saved. She is spared. And so he describes it like, oh, the earth helped her. It opened up, just like God opened the earth to swallow up Korah and his rebellion against Moses in the wilderness. The earth opened up to swallow up the rebels there who were seeking to deceive people into going back to Egypt. Um, so here the earth opens up. But it's not suggesting that by accepting the devil's lies, the world is trying to help the church. It just happens to work out that way, that, that the devil's lies are bought by the world and the church doesn't get carried away. And the dragon ends up, as we last see him here, angry with the woman, and he goes to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Now, all of this is Act 4, Scene 1. This is the first wondrous vision, this whole thing. Then in chapter 13, which we will not take at this time, of course, because we're, well, I don't know, we might get sort of a preview to it, but we certainly won't take it in detail at this time. We have uh, the next scene of the same act, and I just want to point out that there is a, uh, a, a difference that most modern translations make uh, in the transition between chapters 12 and 13, because chapter 12 in our King James says that uh, it ends with a reference to those who have the testimony of Jesus, and then chapter 13 begins, and I stood on the sand of the sea, okay? Um, the newer translations do something like this. They have that first line of chapter 13 belonging to chapter 12, and it's not I who saw stand on the sea, it's the dragon. Uh, let me read, for instance, from the RSV, verse 17 of chapter 12. It says, Then the dragon was angry with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and bear testimony to Jesus, and he, that is the dragon, stood on the sand of the sea. Okay, and then I saw this beast come out of the sea. The idea here, the connection between chapter 12 and chapter 13 is this. The dragon has failed to carry the church away in his deception. And he's going to resort to violence again. And he stands on the sand of the sea. Why? To call out of the sea some help against the church. And what comes out of the sea are, is a beast. This beast becomes a great persecutor of the church. It's an ally of Satan. In fact, it is a thinly disguised devil. Because it is red, it has seven heads and ten horns like he does, and, and uh, I think what we're to see is the beast is sort of like a political, political incarnation of the dragon. 
And I'll tell you my reasons for that. Maybe I should go ahead and start that. We have enough time to begin that. The chapter's too long to hope to finish, but we will go ahead and get started with it. There are two beasts, actually, in chapter 13. Let's go ahead and begin to look at chapter 13 and get into scene two of this act. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded unto death, and the deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. <clears throat> and they worshipped the dragon which gave power to the beast, and they worshipped the beast saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things, and blasphemies, and the power was given unto him to continue forty-two months. <coughs> the whole church age again. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name, and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, and to overcome them. <coughs> that is, outwardly, physically, to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Again, if this is a reference to unsaved people, all that dwell upon the earth is a reference to uh, not every human being, but just the unsaved. Whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So those who are inhabitants of the earth are those whose names are not written in the book of life. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is patience and the faith of the saints. Then we are introduced to another beast. Let's talk about this beast first. It's a frightening thing to become dogmatic about who this beast is because there are so many theories and many identify it as a man who will arise in the last days. To identify the beast as a man is the least likely interpretation to my mind simply because the language of this passage is obviously borrowed from Daniel 7. Daniel 7 also has beasts coming out of the sea. This beast comes out of the sea. In Daniel 7, the four winds strive on the great sea. Out of the sea come four beasts. The first is like a lion. The second is like a bear. The third is like a leopard. And the fourth is indescribably ferocious and, and fierce. The first, the lion represents Babylon. The second represents Media Persia. The leopard represents Greece. And the indescribable beast in Daniel 7 represents Rome, which, by the way, was the ruling power at the time John wrote this. Now, the beast he sees has characteristics of all of the above. It has um, the feet of a... It, has, uh, it was a beast like a leopard, but had the feet of a bear and the mouth as the mouth of a lion. So, and yet it had the characteristics of the fourth beast of Daniel, also because it had seven heads and ten horns, which uh, the beast in Daniel, I don't think it had seven heads, but it had ten horns. So it has characteristics of all four of the beasts of Daniel. Therefore, it should not necessarily be confined to being identified to one of them. Instead, it seems to take them all in. Now, what were they? The beasts of Daniel were empires. They were not individuals. They were empires. Therefore, we would be likely to believe this represents political authority, a political system, uh, or a nation, or something, rather than an individual. To identify it as an individual does not seem to be uh, consistent with the imagery that's taken from Daniel. Okay? Now, uh, one of its heads was wounded. Now, we've got to ask ourselves, what are the seven heads? If we're going to talk about one of them was wounded. Okay? One of the heads was wounded. We're told in chapter 17 that the seven heads are seven hills upon which the beast sits, but it's also, or the woman sits, but also it is seven kings. And we talked about the various theories about that. In this talking about the wounded head, is it talking about one of the kings of Rome, one of the emperors? Some people think so. Some people refer this to the fact that after Nero died, there was a prevalent belief among the Romans that he couldn't really be dead, he was too evil to ever really die, and that there would be a revisitation from, of Nero. And some understood Domitian to be that. And so because of the connection of Nero and Domitian and the second Nero and so forth, some have said this beast represents Nero, uh, or the, at least one of the heads is Nero, and the beast represents the Roman Empire with its seven kings and so forth. Now, it would seem 
to be a fair thing to say that, because in chapter 17 the beast is seen there, <coughs> and it is there that we're told that it's a red beast, a scarlet beast, so it's the same color as the dragon, has the same number of heads and horns as the dragon. But in chapter 17 it would seem that chapter 17 is focusing on Rome in particular, because it says the seven heads are seven hills, and Rome is known as the city of the seven hills. It always has been so known, because it sits on seven hills. This is in chapter 17, verse 9. <coughs> Uh, the, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And then it goes to talk about the kings, the seven kings, which we said probably is a reference to emperors and gave us some idea of the date of the writing of the book. So in chapter 17, the beast is identified with Rome. And if there's any question about it, look at the last verse in chapter 17. Um, well, not the last verse yet. Let's look at this. Um, Verse, well, 15 to the end. He, and he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, she was on the beast, are the peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues, and the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is the great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Now the woman is identified as the city that reigns over the kings of the earth, present tense. In John's day, that was the city of Rome. And therefore the beast would be the Roman Empire upon which the city of Rome sat or rested. And the ten horns would be ten uh, ethnic kingdoms that were under the Roman Empire at that time, into which it later dissolved. You remember in Daniel's vision in chapter 7, the beast with seven horn, uh, ten horns, we're specifically told the ten horns are ten kings that d rise up after the beast is gone. That is, the, the ten ethnic European nations that replaced the Roman Empire, and I gave you a list of them when we studied Daniel. The point here is that the beast in Revelation 17 is seemingly identified with Rome and the Roman Empire. That makes plenty of sense. But in chapter 13, it would seem that we shouldn't identify it just with Rome because it has the represented, it has parts of the leopard and the bear and the lion also. And it might be better to say <coughs> that there is a general and a specific application of this piece. The general application is it represents political powers hostile to the church regardless of when they arise or what form they take. However, in the time that John wrote this, that happened to be Rome. So the beast to them was Rome. To the Soviets, the beast is the Communist Party or the, or the, or whatever, you know. Um, that is, whatever political authority is organized and, in, and empowered by Satan to persecute the church is the beast. It is the political incarnation of the dragon. And there's no question but that in John's day that would regularly be recognized as Rome. And therefore, even the name of the beast that's given later in this chapter, is not his name is not given, but his number is given. <clears throat> in verse 18 of chapter 13, Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And, or actually, better translation, it is a human number. It's not of God. It says man. And his number is 603 score and 6, 666. Uh, there have been so many different ways that people have tried to figure out what 666 means that we would not even have the time to survey them. But one of the prevalent views that has been held from earliest times is that this is a reference to Caesar Nero, who was the recently fallen Caesar at the time that this was written. And uh, his, his name, when calculated out in, the, in Hebrew characters or in Greek characters, I forget which, uh, you take the numerical equivalent, since the Greek, Greek language and the Hebrew language both use letters for numerals. You take the numeric equivalent of the letters of his name, Caesar Nero comes out to a total of 666. I've seen it worked out. It, it works. And that's, and that, but that's, of course, there's other people that you could do the same thing with. The question is, what did John intend his readers to know? He wanted them to know that this beast, which stands for something very general that, that pervades the whole of church history, yet in their day, he wanted them to know who it was he was talking about. He's talking about the Roman Empire that was persecuting the church at that time. And Caesar Nero 
was the most, uh, you see, at, th at this time, if Domitian was temporarily reigning in the absence of Nero, because Nero had died within a year before that, there had been a year of four emperors trying to get the throne, and none of them got it. Vespasian was on his way there. He became the next emperor. But it's like the head that, that died, and everyone wondered that it came back to life, could be, again, a reference to Rome. Because Rome would seem to be, at the death of Nero, I've, I've read some people who've said that, that when Nero was killed, Rome was thrown into such chaos, with all the people fighting for power in the city, and Galba and Otho and Vitilius and Vespasian all claiming uh, rights to be emperor, and all the assassinations taking place, that, that the Roman Empire could have recovered from that would be amazing. And it was amazing that it did come out of that time of its wound, it, its head being wounded, as it were, by the uh, suicide of Nero, and it came back to power again, and the world wondered, and it continued to persecute the church after that. And some would identify the wounded head that recovered uh, as a reference to that period. Which Everything we will read about the beast has its primary relevance to the Roman Empire, but we can see that it is it, it extends beyond that. The Roman Empire has fallen, but there have been other beasts. There have been other manifestations of the beast. Anytime Satan, failing to conquer the church through deception, seeks to conquer the church through hostile political power, this, I believe, is another manifestation of this same beast. And uh, there may be yet other manifestations in the future that we have not yet seen. There certainly are some at this present time in the world, in the communist governments that are persecuting the church. This I would uh, identify as a present manifestation of this same beast. But as we read, don't be surprised if the major things that are brought out in the description, especially in chapter 17, when the beast is further described and the symbols are, are defined, are explained, they, they refer to Rome. Because John was, first of all, writing to his own people, his own churches. He was a pastor or an apostle with a pastoral heart for these seven churches, and they were being persecuted or threatened with persecution from Rome. So, of course, with these people on his heart, and those were the people that were on Jesus' heart principally at this time, too, because they were his people living at that time, this book was given as a message to them about the persecutions that come from Rome. Now, what I've even just discovered, even as recently as today or yesterday, as I've considered the way the book is laid out, remember I pointed out that in the first half of the book, there, especially with the opening of the seven seals of the second vision, there was a focus especially on the fall of Jerusalem, which had been the first persecutor of the church and which fell in 70 AD. And I said that in the second half of the book, uh, we turn our attention from the, the fall of Jerusalem to the fall of Rome as the motif of, of, of judgment. And, of course, the early Christians suffered at the hands both of Jerusalem and Rome, and both of those cities have fallen since. I mean, in th that's history for us now. And, uh, I, of course, I've known that about the book for a long time, but one thing I just discovered as I was thinking about the way the book was laid out in its seven acts, if you'll consider this. Act one, of course, is about the seven churches, and therefore it doesn't, it doesn't relate to any one period of history any more than any other, and it's not even a judgment motif at all. It's more or less Christ's message to his churches. But when you get to Act 2, that's the seven seals, and that seems to focus almost entirely on the fall of Jerusalem. Then the next act, which springs from Act 2, because the seventh seal is broken, then there's silence, then the seven trumpeters appear and sound their trumpets. In the, seventh, uh, in the third act, that is, the trumpets sound, and trumpets characteristically are for getting people's attention. They're to sound a warning. Uh, of course, they're used for other purposes, but these trumpets are not for musical instruments. Uh, these are not for playing music. These are for sounding a warning. And in each trumpet blast, we see a partial uh, judgment. A third of the sun, a third of the sea, a third of the rivers, a third of mankind are destroyed and affected by these things. And I said that this reference to a third of each of these things speaks of a significant minority. That is to say, this is not a complete judgment. This is just partial judgments. And I believe, as I said then, that those judgments, trumpet judgments, apply to things beyond the fall of Jerusalem. That is, through the church age, the whole way that God generally judges, until you get to the fifth and sixth, which seem to be focused on the last period of history before Jesus comes back. The first four trumpets uh, would appear to be giving us just the general thought 
that God affects man indirectly through his environment, uh, through famines and, and uh, you know, uh, droughts and floods and fires and things like that. He affects man's environment. He affects nature adversely to get man's attention, as a trumpet is to get one's attention. These judgments are partial judgments, like a warning shot fired over the head of a person who's running. You want him to stop running and turn around. God is, God is trying to get people to turn around by getting their attention with these trumpet judgments. But what I tried to show you was that the connection between the second and the third act was this. The second act of the, ten, of the seven seals principally focused on the fall of Jerusalem. And then the other third act of the trumpets looked beyond the fall of Jerusalem through the whole church age, more or less, to the end of the age. And then what we'll find, I think, is that this um, third, let's see if I'm correct here, this fourth act, is, is kind of generally about the church age too, although it, it, it's, it's cast in a fall of Rome kind of motif, only the beast doesn't actually fall in this act, he falls in the next one. And uh, what we have is, we have the second act depicts the fall of Jerusalem, the third act looks beyond it through the rest of church history. Then the, this act, the fourth one, sort of depicts uh, introduces the Roman state, but also as a type of other persecuting governments. But then the fifth act, which we will hopefully cover, which is the bowls of wrath being poured out, this, I think, actually does speak um, of a complete judgment on Rome. And we also see in the fall of Babylon, in the sixth act, apparently a reference to the fall of Rome, uh, but looking probably beyond that because this beast is associated with Babylon. And therefore, Rome was called Babylon by the early Christians. And uh, as there is a continuation of this beast, so there is a continuation of Babylon, I believe, uh, that must yet fall at the coming of Christ. But when you get to the last act, you're not looking at those things at all anymore. You're looking at the church again, just as you did in the first act. The first and the last act are all about the church. And they're not so much about uh, God's judgments on the earth. You know, you're, in the last act, we read about the victory of the Lamb and the new heavens and the new earth and things like that. So sandwiched in between the first and the last act, we have a, an act that specifically deals with the fall of Jerusalem. Some that seem to specifically deal with the fall of Rome to some degree, but each of these have ramifications that carry on through the rest of church age. Now, if that didn't clarify anything, that's okay. I hope it'll come clear as we go through. But when we describe this beast, realize that the early Christians who read this book would have understood this beast to be Rome, and we can understand that it did apply to Rome, and yet to others since Rome too, I believe. And it, so the beast continues for 42 months, we're told in verse 5 of chapter 13. He blasphemes against God, as the emperors did. They, they required worship uh, of themselves, and they persecuted Christians who wouldn't worship them. And, uh, and so this 42 months, however, ex extends through the whole church age. Now, it's an interesting thing. Nero who was the first emperor to really persecute the church, the Neroian persecution was from the middle of uh, 64 A.D. until his death in 68 A.D. And you'll find that his persecution was just about exactly three and a half years, which, is, which means that he, the persecution that Nero instigated was almost exactly 42 months. But also the figure, I believe, is symbolic as elsewhere of the longer period, and Nero's persecution, like that of Antiochus Epiphanes, was a type of the whole trend of persecution of the church that would extend through the whole church age. Now, we see that uh, in verse 7 of chapter 13, it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. To overcome them, of course, suggests he overcomes them physically, in the physical sense. He is able to kill them, in other words. Because they're not fighting in a physical battle. They don't even fight back. When he arrests them, they just go to their death singing. And so he's able to overcome them in that sense. But we're already told in chapter 12 that they overcame him. They overcame the devil by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony and by loving not their lives unto the death in chapter 12 and verse 11. So there's a sense in which they overcame him. Their, their ministry continued to penetrate and overcome the devil's territory. But in a sense... His political agents do overcome them in driving them underground, in uh, killing them, imprisoning them, and so forth, making, making life miserable for them. 
And uh, it says, all in verse 8, all that dwell upon the earth, and I've told you that that could be seen as a technical term for all unbelievers in general, uh, shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life slain from the foundation of the world, suggesting that Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world or else that their names were written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. That expression, from the foundation of the world, can attach to either of those thoughts and it's uh, different translators uh, have chosen different ways of seeing that. But in any case, it shows that before the world came into existence, the, our salvation through Christ was uh, predestined or foreseen. Okay, and um, then it says, If any man hear, let him hear. Verses 9 and 10. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword, he must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Now, this verse 10 in particular is a bit confusing because new translations have chosen to translate it differently. Though apparently there's some question as to the correct way. The way the King James reads, it sounds like those who are now leading the Christians into captivity will someday go into captivity themselves. Those who are killing the Christians with the sword will someday themselves suffer at the, at the sword. And that would seem to be supported by Jesus' own statement, which is not hard to translate, where he said those who live by the sword will die by the sword. And in this case, if the King James is the right translation, what it is saying is it's an encouragement to the church. Those who are now persecuting them and imprisoning them will someday have to face a just retribution, and it only requires patience on the part of the saints uh, until this happens, endurance on their part. Other translations have said uh, those who are to be imprisoned will be imprisoned or led into captivity. Those who are to be slain with the sword will will be slain with the sword, as though it's saying uh, God has earmarked certain people for captivity and for the sword, and it's inevitable that those that are destined for that will go to that, and that uh, you know people should not seek to save their lives. Jesus said, he that seeks to save his life shall lose it, but he will lose his life for my sake shall find it unto life eternal. So the thought, if, if the other translation is correct, is that uh, don't try to escape this persecution, just realize that God has destined that some are going to be martyrs, some are going to go into captivity, and uh, if, if you're one of those, you can't hope to escape it, because those who are to go into captivity will go into captivity, is how they translate it. So apparently there's some confusion as to what that means. In either case, we could get a valid Christian thought out of it. Now we're introduced to the second beast, verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doth great wonders, so that he maketh fire to come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had the power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image of the beast and which had a wound by the sword and did live, and he might, I'm sorry, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bound, to receive a mark in their right hands or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name, here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six, or six, six, six. The only place in the Bible that mentions that number. Now, notice this. The description of the first beast ends with a call for the patience of the saints. The patience and the faith of the saints is called for in verse 10. Uh, as the first beast has been described, at the end of the description of the second beast, there's a call for wisdom. Uh, so there needs to be some discernment about this second beast. Now, who is this second beast? This is an, a question that has not received any uh, uh, agreement among scholars in being answered. Uh, it seems the, the majority of scholars believe that this beast <coughs> represents the emperor cult, that is, the religious side, not only the political side of the Roman Empire, but the religious spirit that, that, uh, that made the emperor a god that required people to worship the emperor, which was prevalent during the reign of the Caesars. And uh, whether it indicates an individual 
or just another, more like a spiritual system. Now notice it has horns like a lamb. Well, we've already been introduced to the lamb. The lamb had seven horns, which represents all power. Seven being the number of perfection and horns representing power. This beast had power too. It was the same kind of power as the lamb, although it is not said to have seven horns. It doesn't have all power like he does. Yet he exercises power of the same type. That is probably to say spiritual power or a religious influence. Uh, he is a religious <coughs> in nature, and yet his words are not at all like those of the lamb. His, he speaks like the dragon. It's very clear that, or maybe not very clear, but it seems clear to me, that this beast is somehow associated with a false religious system. Some would understand this as representing paganism, as, so that the, the first beast is the hostile <coughs> political powers against the church. The second beast represents the hostile pagan religions against the church, <coughs> and particularly those which prevailed in the days of John, uh, the paganism that included the emperor among the gods and made it necessary to worship him. Uh, let's go on and look at some of these verses, verse by verse, about him and see what it says. It says he operates uh, with all the power of the first beast before him, in verse 12, and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed, by the way, I didn't remind you, but I said yesterday about the deadly wound that was healed. Uh, it could be understood more than one way. Some understand this to be a reference to the, the prevailing superstition that Nero, after dying, would, would be resurrected and that, and that Domitian himself is seen as that deadly wound, that was that head that received a deadly wound and resurrected. I don't necessarily think that's correct. I think it's very possible that it's talking about the Roman Empire itself, which after Nero's death almost collapsed in the civil wars in Rome that took place for a full year, in the year of the four emperors, and uh, but which came back to life, as it were. And there seem to be a number of commentators who understand it so, that the Roman Empire itself had received a deadly wound. It seemed like it was on its last leg, like it was going to fall, but it recovered. And all the world wondered at that recovery. They didn't think it was possible after all of that uh, investigation. It's to his credit that he was able to pull the empire back together. At any rate, this... Um, this second beast enforces the worship of the first beast. And we could see this as, as having its reference to the fact that the pagan cult of the emperor required the, the Christians and others to worship the emperor in the days of the Roman Empire. There is still, by the way, a religious spirit in some countries, including our own here, that practically enforces worship of the state. Um, and by the way, America would be a hard... A lot of people would be offended if we suggested that America could, in any sense, be a manifestation of the beast. But uh, somebody just told me a figure the other day, day before yesterday, that there are more Christians in prison in America than in Soviet Russia. Now, some of them may have been converted in prison, I don't know, but a lot of them are in prison because they've resisted the state in opening Christian schools and refusing to uh, accredit their teachers and refusing to come under the state's supervision with their church schools. And there's quite a few pastors and so forth in prison today in this country because they won't cooperate with the state. And uh, so, while we don't see overt persecution of the church here like we do in Russia, uh, it might not be uh, too far afield to suggest that even the American government uh, can become a tool for Satan to persecute the church. And yet, amazingly, even within the church, there are those who advocate a high degree of patriotism and, and statism and nationalism toward the country and suggest that this is a basically Christian nation and that the majority are basically moral and godly in their, you know, convictions and so forth. And I've, I've never been able to uh, feel myself in, in, in harmonious company with those who suggest such things. I don't really see any connection between the, the American state as it exists today and the kingdom of God. Um, but there are always religious uh, systems that advocate patriotism and nationalism and statism, and that was true in the Roman Empire. It's been true since then. And that is more or less how I understand this second beast. I may not be correct in so understanding, but I'm only able to tell you the, the, the understanding that I have and not any other. Um, he is given miraculous power, it would seem. He calls fire out of heaven and gives life to an image of the beast. I can't tell you exactly what this refers to, but I will say this, that I am convinced that the miracles done by the two witnesses for instance, of causing fire to proceed out of their mouths and consume their enemies in chapter 11 and uh, stopping the rain for three and a half years and things like that, 
are mostly symbolic in their nature. That is, they don't refer to, to literally anyone in the church, past, present, or future, opening their mouth and a flamethrower consumes all their enemies. I just, I believe that's symbolic of miraculous power, but not necessarily of the specific miracle described. I, as I said, I believe that those miracles attributed to the two witnesses are chosen simply to identify them as being like Elijah and Moses. <coughs> and here, whether the, this uh, second beast actually does the exact miracles that are attributed to him here, or, or whether these are symbolic of something, for instance, symbolic of his mimicry of God's miracles, calling fire out of heaven is something that Elijah did. Uh, he's mimicking the miracles of God. He's counterfeiting the miracles of God. Uh, giving life to a statue, um, I, I honestly don't know exactly what that refers to. Some people think that really does refer to a man uh, whom they identify as the false prophet, who in the future will make a statue of the political leader of the world and, and cause the, the statue to begin to speak and so forth. And I, I couldn't be sure that that won't happen, but I'm certainly not convinced that that's what this is talking about either. I don't know what to say, and this is one of those areas where I have to confess I don't have any personal revelation on the matter, and I have to leave it in your, to your discretion to decide what you think it's talking about. Um, but we can see this. There are certain things said that this beast does. In verse 16, he requires everyone, whether rich or poor, bond or free, to have a mark in their hand or in their forehead. And that mark is supposed to be uh, the name of the beast or else the number of his name, numbers being symbolic, of course, and referring to the name of the beast in numbers, and he gives the number of his name is 666. And it says that those who do not take this mark will be subject to economic sanctions. They will not be permitted to operate a business and sell anything. They will not be permitted to buy in the stores. And uh, now there's been so much of the uh, dispensationalist literature and publicity on this particular aspect of this chapter uh, that it's hard for us to divorce ourselves from, from the futurist approach. Of course, what you've heard, no doubt, is that there is a big computer in Brussels operated by the European Common Market and that it has the names of every person on the earth in it, or at least it has the capacity for that, and it, they intend to, they call it affectionately the beast, and uh, the intention is to uh, give a number, uh, three six-digit number, that is uh, six digits three times, so the 18 digits, uh, one to every person on earth, and that uh, this is to be laser tattooed or put with chips under the skin on the hand or the forehead to be discerned only by electronic equipment, and that if and this would replace credit cards and, re, and and bring in a cashless society. And if you wanted to, if you worked at a job rather than you being paid, it would simply be credited to a number on your account. Then when you go into the store, you put your hand under the black light or under the detector, and then uh, they automatically uh, you know take the money out of your or the the credit out of your account, so that you move into a cashless society. And obviously, if you didn't have this number, you'd be unable to sell or buy. This is the scenario that we've been given, and usually the fact that a lot of gas stations have moved toward credit and things like that, and, and some places, there are some banks that are now, you know, in fact, all banks, I imagine, now will allow you to have your check automatically de deposited and things like that so that you never even see the money. Uh, these kinds of things are pointed to as evidence that this is really happening, just like it's written here. Now, I'm not going to tell you that that's not going to happen. Maybe that is going to happen. Uh, I don't know if it is or not. I will say this, that I'm not convinced that this, ch this chapter is saying that that is going to happen. If it does happen, then it won't necessarily prove me wrong, because I'm not saying it won't. But what I can say is this. We saw already in chapter 7 a group of people who received the seal of God on their forehead. And I don't know anybody who would say that this seal was a visible, tangible, literal seal. This, the, the reference to a seal, of course, is to a, a signet, a king's signet of ownership. And the image of uh, Revelation 7 with the seal of God being placed on the forehead of his people is borrowed from Ezekiel 9 where an angel went through Jerusalem and put a mark with an ink pen on the foreheads of everyone who sighed and cried over the abominations done in Jerusalem and they were spared from judgment because of it. Uh, I don't think anyone believes that there was a literal ink mark that was placed on the foreheads of any of those people in Ezekiel's day but it was symbolic of the fact that they had the mark of God on them and belonged to him. 
And the mark of the beast could as easily refer to something as symbolic rather than a literal laser tattooed uh, symbol on your hand or forehead, but could represent your belonging to him. Now, wh why the hand or the forehead? I find it interesting to connect this thought with that in Deuteronomy chapter 6. <coughs> Excuse me. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and uh, verse 6 and following says, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently to thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest in the way, and when thou liest down, when thou risest up. Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes, in other words, on your forehead. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and upon thy gates. Now, the Jews took this very literally, and they they bound onto their hands and onto their foreheads little boxes containing fragments of scripture, and they called them uh, phylacteries. And Jesus seemed to mock this practice when he said to the Jews, to the scribes and Pharisees, Woe unto you, you make broad your phylacteries. You know, you, they, there was some competition to see who could wear the biggest phylactery to show how much scripture they had on their forehead or on their hand. Because they took literally what he was saying. But what seems to be intended here... To have the law always before your eyes would mean to always be, have it, always have your attention upon it. Always be looking to the law. Always be thinking about the law. To have your hands bound to it would suggest that your actions and your works would be governed by your, your loyalty to the law. That is, your forehead and your hand would represent your thoughts and your actions, your thoughts and your words. And that is at least how I understand Deuteronomy 6 in this connection. I believe that is the intended meaning. And now we have the same two things, the right hand and the forehead here. Uh, people are required to have the mark of the beast. I am willing to at least suggest that this may refer simply to the fact that certain people are required to think and act according to the desires of the beast. Uh, that is to say, their actions and their thoughts are to be like his and to be conformed to him. And if they do not bear the mark of the same philosophy, the same belief system, uh, the same kind of lifestyle as that practiced by those who worship the beast, then there will be persecution against them. And it could even be in the form of economic <clears throat> sanctions. And in fact, you know, many who read the letters to the seven churches believe that the church of Smyrna was suffering its poverty because of the economic sanctions brought against it by the Jewish community. Uh, if you read the letter again to the church of Smyrna in chapter 2, you'll find that there was a, they were being persecuted by the Jews and they were said to be an extremely poor church. And the Jews were controlling a lot of the commerce and business, and, and many scholars have felt that the reason the church was poor is because the Jews, in their persecution of the church, were refusing, um, they were boycotting uh, Christians and things like that, so that this, is, this would actually represent a type of persecution that was already going on to the church when John wrote this. At least some of the churches were experiencing this. And... Um, whether this is to be taken absolutely literally and globally in the end of the age is something that I'll leave to others to debate. But I will say this, I am willing to believe that it has its fulfillment in, in situations where people who have persecuted Christians uh, for financial, in financial ways or other ways uh, have done so because the Christians' lives and thoughts do not conform to theirs, uh, to those of those who worship the beast. Uh, they don't have the mark on their heads and in their hands. And uh, so that is my understanding of it. Now, what about the number 666? Um, by the way, the reference I made to the computer in Brussels and all this, um, the only sources I've ever gotten any information about that from are Christian sources. And I must say that, I think I told you earlier in the year, I, I've become kind of suspicious about news stories that are only known by Christians, um, especially if they seem to confirm a particular view of prophecy. And I've told you that I once heard a report that there were a, an immense number of vultures accumulating at the Valley of Megiddo, and it, and it was a fulfillment of the prophecy in, in uh, Revelation 19 about how an angel calls to the vultures and birds of carrion birds to come and eat the flesh of kings and horses and so forth. This was many years ago. In fact, those birds would have died of old age by now if they were ever there. But you never find any uh, secular source reporting that there was an uncanny um, accumulation of, of birds there. Uh, and I myself doubt it. And then you've heard, of course, the story about the space scientists in Florida who, by the use of their computers, found there was a missing day in 20 minutes uh, 
not accounted for in the movement of the heavenly bodies, and then they remembered that there had been a whole day when the sun stood still in the book of Joshua, and that in the days of Hezekiah the sun had gone back ten degrees, and that explained it all, you know, where this missing time was, and uh, that's been printed. That story's been printed in newspapers across the nation. I've seen it printed up in tracts. Um, at least two people I know of have written to Nassau to ask about that, and they've gotten the response that the people there don't know anything about it. The scientists who are named in the article are not known to the people in Nassau. It begins to uh, either look like there's a conspiracy of silence, or else Christians are making up stories to confirm their particular doctrinal positions. And I'd hate to say that any Christians would be dishonest, and I have a feeling that a lot of people who are weak-minded tend to believe what they want to believe, and I'm not saying that those who believe in this Brussels computer are weak-minded. I'm simply saying, I don't know what sources there are for this information outside of the Christian tracts and books that are written on the subject. And uh, and there may be some, but I'm, I can't confirm that those things exist except from people who only bring them up to confirm a particular line of prophetic interpretation that they hold. And they may be right or they may be wrong. But I know this, the number 666 was historically understood by the church to refer to Caesar Nero because his name, when translated into Hebrew letters, uh, the numeric equivalent of the letters of his name, uh, added up, uh, incidentally, to 666. Now, 666 is also symbolic for other reasons. It says very specifically, it's the number of a man, or more properly from the Greek, it is a human number. It's the number of man. Whereas seven is the number of perfection, and three is the number of God, usually considered to be. Uh, God would be a perfect seven, 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 three sevens, but man is less than that and falls short of perfection, And but it may refer to man's attempt to be like God, uh, but but failure to be so, it's a, it's a human number, it's a number of humanity. And uh, it, it may be coincidental that Caesar Nero's name happens to come out to 666, so did Henry Kissinger's name, by the way, as several books pointed out, but, and, uh, and so did Mussolini and some other people. I, there's been some very ingenious uh, methods employed to uh, identify the 666 with the name of current uh, unlikable people uh, by Christians over the years. And... You know, I, I don't necessarily believe that it, it's saying that there's going to be a last day's man who has this number associated with his name, but, or that there will be literally a tattoo of 666 on people's hands and foreheads. Yet, I can't say there won't be. All I'm saying is the thought of this book, that's not how the, that's not how the early Christians would have understood it. They would have understood it as a sort of a subtle reference to Nero, given symbolically using his name in Hebrew letters rather than Roman letters so that uh, he wouldn't, if he happened to get his hands on this thing, or if the emperors did, they wouldn't recognize a backhanded reference to him as the beast. The early Christians apparently did call Nero the beast, and so what I'm saying is the beast, as I've understood it to refer to all political anti-Christian power throughout the ages, had its special description in this book of the Roman Empire, which was the current manifestation of the beast at that time. And the second beast, I believe, simply refers to the spiritual religious aspects of the emperor cult that enforced the worship of the emperor and where economic sanctions were being placed at least on some Christians who were refusing to conform to those who worship the beast. That is my understanding of chapter 13. It's, I know it's very different than that. which. Is